So the most unsung country in the world, I think, is Lithuania. There are so many things that are unique to Lithuania that you don't see anywhere else on earth. Let's discuss. Hello everyone, welcome to Dangerous Policy. My name is Crispin. Today I want to talk about Lithuania, uh, which is a great passion of mine. And I want to do it now because I've, I've just done a couple of segments on Russia, which is kind of pro-Russia, even pro-Putin. And uh, I don't want anyone to think, particularly my Baltic friends, that this means that you know I'm selling Baltic states down the river or anything like that. I'm absolutely committed to the security. And in fact, I can see myself retiring for doing this, to be honest. I, 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 I love the Baltic states and I, and I wouldn't have any trouble living there. Um, but I want to talk about Lithuania because they've made a unique set of contributions to the human race. And even the Lithuanians themselves, I would say, aren't particularly well versed in that uh, and it's a real you know anguish for me that that lithuanians don't have the degree of pride and knowledge of their national culture and history that i think that they should and, and richly deserve so the first thing that i would say that's unique to lithuania is their language they have the oldest language in europe and not just by a little bit they predate latin by thousands of years They've inherited that language from ancient Hittite, the cuneiform language of the northern Mesopotamia region, modern-day Turkey, uh, where the, the uh, former Hittite empire that, that fell um, with the Bronze Age collapse, uh, they um, clearly found their way to the Baltic um, because that language is the direct custodian and descendant of that, that, ancient, that ancient language today. And, and, and a language that was preserved very carefully um, uh, during the 19th century and then again during the Soviet occupation um, through diligent work of, of um, a, a range of unsung translators who, who deserve a lot of credit. Um, so, so ancient Lithuanian is the, um, you know, modern Lithuanian is, is the inheritor of a long tradition and much more, I think, archaeological work needs to be done and genealogical work needs to be done in order to um, trace the descendancy of, of the Lithuanian people, which I think have, have um, populated an entire northern European region. I think much of the, the European history and, and, and origin is from Lithuania. I would say that, for example, um, uh, religion also um, would be probably, I would say, descendant of, um, of the Lithuanian tradition rather than, say, the Nordic tradition. Um, and so that brings us to, to religion. And, and one of the things that's fascinating about Lithuania is it was the last country in Europe to be Christianized. And not just by a little bit, like a hundred years. They lived in a, in a world where every single power around them was a Christian power, whether it would be the sort of Roman tradition of the Teutonic order or the, um, or the Orthodox tradition of the, of the Kingdom of Novgorod. Um, they preserve their independence. Oh, oh the Golden Horde, um, which had converted to Islam, um, that they preserved their independence with their pagan Lithuanian traditions um, for forever. Um, and, they, and when they did actually convert, um, it was by choice. It wasn't um, a forced conversion largely. There was you know, a lot of diplomatic and political benefits in doing so. But basically it wasn't by its military force of arms, which the... the um, uh, Northern Crusades was was about trying. I mean, the whole Teutonic Order was founded to fight essentially the Lithuanians, and then the Lithuanian tradition, as part of the the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, um, is an incredible history. I mean, that right through to the defeat of the Teutonic Order at the Battle of Grunwald, um, and then beyond, hundreds of years, uh, it, it, extraordinary history. And I, I think that it's 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 not told every day in the way that I think it should be. I think it should be taught in schools right across Europe and across the world. Um, and, and certainly to the Lithuanians themselves, who I think are, are losing connection with um, what is a very proud and uniquely prominent contribution to the human race. But we do see it in, in certain modern traditions. So, for example, um, Lithuanian names, uh, Gintare, um, uh, Egle, th these are, um, uh, have these pagan Lithuanian roots. So there's a lot of amber in Lithuania, um, and that's tied in with their pagan traditions of so amber in Lithuanian is Gintare, um, and a lot of people named amber. Um, and 
and Lithuanian amber is gorgeous. I mean, that's uh, you should should definitely go to those um, uh, you know the, those traditional stores and and, and jewelers. Um, but also, uh, you know, the pagan Lithuanian tradition, and it's not very well known. So we we know all about Thor and Loki and all of that from the the um, you know Denmark and and Norway. Um, but we don't have the same degree of knowledge about the pagan Lithuanian traditions of Lithuania, which is quite similar, um, but, but there are some, some differences. But we do have some stories that are passed down to us, and I want to discuss one story now which I absolutely love, and that is the story of Egle, Queen of the Serpents. Okay, So once upon a time, there was a young farm girl who... Um, uh, was in the bath and she got out of the bath and she saw a serpent in the hallway wearing her clothes and the serpent said um, oh you know I've got your clothes uh, and Egle's like give them back and the serpent said well I'll give it back to you but you have to pledge yourself to me and long story short she said she agreed uh, and she's like okay well I'll, I'll um, let you get your affairs in order here and uh, I'll send for you in a few days time Anyway, Egle had 12 older brothers who didn't want to give her up and, uh, and this um, uh, snake showed up a few days later and said, look, you know, let's, um, uh, I'm here for Egle. And uh, the brothers said, oh, he's a chicken. Uh, that's Egle. You can uh, take her away. Um, and so they took the chicken away. And then the next day, the, a bunch of snakes showed up quite angrily and were like, oh, where's the real Egle? And they were pointed to a sheep and they're like, ah, oh, yes, you got us. This is the, this is the real Egle. And then on the third day, the entire village was swamped by these sea creatures who went through all the houses and tumbled all the barns and looked through all the areas. And where they found Egle, they, uh, they took her and they carried her to the ocean and took her to the bottom of the ocean um, where uh, she met the Serpent King. And the Serpent King down at the bottom of the ocean wasn't a serpent, but in fact a, a very handsome king uh, who was, had a human form and they got married. Anyway, so years later, uh, they had four children, three sons and a daughter. Um, and Egle said, look, I want to take the kids and go visit the family, right? I haven't been to the, to the shore in a long time and uh, my brothers will be worried about me and I'd like to go introduce them to our children. And the Serpent King said, well, you know, no, you're still like, in, you're now the queen of the underworld, or, or of, the, of the undersea, you know, all the sea creatures are now your um, are now your servants. It wouldn't be appropriate for you to go back to a village where you're just a farm girl when you are now a great and mighty ruler. Um, and uh, they were living in the Amber Palace at the bottom of the sea, which has an interesting story of its own, but we probably don't have time for it today. Anyway, so they're at the Amber Palace and, and the, 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 the Serpent King is reluctant to let her go. Anyway, she nags him about this for a while and he's like, okay, well, if you complete three tasks... Uh, then, then I'll let you go. And he basically comes up with three impossible tasks um, for, for um, Egle to complete. The first of these is to, I think, bake a pie with no utensils, um, spin an everlasting thread and wear down a pair of iron shoes, if I remember the story correctly. Anyway, she gets the help of a sorcerer and there's this long tale of adventure and uh, ultimately she finds a way to complete these three tasks and... And uh, eventually he's like, fine, okay, well, you've obviously been banging on about this for a while and I did say that it would be okay. So um, uh, she takes the four children and she goes to the surface and goes back to the village where she was and tells them the great story of what happened. Uh, anyway, so they're, they're out hanging out there for about a month and they're reconnecting and, and so on. And then she's like, all right, it's about time that the children and I go back to rule the, the oceans. Anyway, the brothers don't want to let her go. And this is a really interesting bit of the story. So the brothers don't want to let her go. And they think, okay, well, the only way that we can really prevent this is if we kill the Serpent King because they stole Egle away from us in a completely illegitimate way. Uh, and, um, and therefore, we need to get our revenge so that we can keep our sister. And... Um, so they knew that Egle was never going to give him up because she was deeply in love with, with the Serpent King. And um, so they did something horrible, which is they started torturing the children, right? And the three brothers, they didn't say anything. But the daughter, who had was seeing what was happening to the brothers, um, spilled the beans and said, look, if you say this poem, it will bring 
the serpent king to the surface. It will summon him. Uh, and if he's down there, he'll, he'll come up. If it's not down there, then the ocean will turn red with, with blood. Um, anyway, they take this knowledge and they go to the ocean side and they say this poem. And sure enough, the serpent king pops to the surface and they hack him to bits with, with scythes. And satisfied that they have now dealt with the problem, they go back to England and they're like, all right, fine, you can go. Um, thinking that, you know, she'll go to the, the ocean side and uh, once they realise there's nothing for her, then, then she'll come back. Anyway, so she goes to the ocean and says this poem, and sure enough, the ocean turns red with blood, and she interrogates the kids as to what happened, and they spill the beans immediately. And, uh, and she gets her revenge by turning herself and her four children into trees. And the three sons are turned into these three strongest trees of, of the Baltic, so I think, you know, oak tree, pine tree, that sort of stuff. And the daughter, um, in punishment for you know, uh, for for say spilling the beans and getting the father killed, um, is a sad story. She, she gets turned into some horrible weed that plagues like crops and stuff in Lithuania. Um, but those trees uh, become central to to Lithuanian worship. And if you think of um, Game of Thrones and Westeros and the old gods and the and the weirwood trees, um, that whole tradition. I think is, is a Lithuanian tradition that the, that, that um, George R. R. Martin, in my opinion, got his um, got his his old god religion approach, you know, children of the forest and all of that from a pagan and Lithuanian source. It, 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 think pagan Lithuanian is not something we know a lot about. Um, unfortunately, we should know a lot more, and I think that that um, historical work can be done to to uncover that. But it's um, but that whole sense of speaking to the trees and feeling like the gods are hearing you and, and that there's a lot more out there um, is, is very much in the, in the Lithuanian kind of combination of uh, a sort of pantheon of, um, uh, of gods and a sort of a naturist animist approach sort of blended into one. So I think Lithuanian religion is something that we need to know a lot more about in pagan Lithuanian religion. Um, its role in the, pay, in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth is, is always taken as a subordinate role. I don't think that's fair. I think Lithuania did contribute significantly to the Polish Lithuanian culture and life, and much of Polish life today owes itself from Lithuanians. Um, but Lithuania is going through a bit of a tragic period in that they, um, well, their, their economy had been growing up until COVID, so that was good. And every time I go back to Vilnius, I go back every couple of years. And each time I go back, it's better and better. Like life seems to be getting better and better. I would like to see what a post-COVID Lithuania looks like. But what they did have was a significant period of, um, and, and to this day I think is continuing, of declining population. And that's because they're bright young people that were highly educated. Now that they're part of the EU and, and part of um, NATO, they tend to, to migrate west to you know France and the UK and so on to, to get better jobs and conditions and salaries because uh, the income is still fairly modest in, in Lithuania. But uh, look, if you want a trip somewhere um, that is A, safe, B, um, tr truly European, like you want to kind of go to old towns and things like that, but also somewhat off the off the track, I cannot I cannot recommend Lithuania highly enough. It's, it's, it's a place I keep going back to because I love and I'll absolutely be living through a time of Vilnius. And I think that they need to maintain their independence forever um, in order to preserve what is a special um, historical and cultural tradition that is quite unique to only a few million people, and I, and so for that reason, um, you know, I'll always I'll always be a fan of of the Baltic states uh, and their tradition. Um, so uh, uh, this is my shout out, my my affection for Lithuania, just in case you know, in in the many times in which I will try and say, look, we need to improve our relationship with Russia because of China and other things. That doesn't mean to say that, you know, it's part of that that's on the table is a compromise on the Baltic states. That's not on the table and it should never be. So hope you're all well. <laughs>